Hello world. Michael Braun is a legendary fashion designer best known for making flamboyant stage clothing for pop culture icons such as Jimi Hendrix, Bob Dylan, Hulk Hogan, and Macho Man Randy Savage, and the list goes on and on. If you've ever seen a wrestling video of the Macho Man wearing a crazy outfit, it was made by Michael Braun. On this episode, Michael details his very close relationship with Jimi Hendrix and the psyche of Jimmy and the way he thought and the way he communicated. He even shows these handwritten letters that Jimmy would write to him all the time. This episode is a gripping look into the creative mind and business mind of someone whose day job was making wearable art for the world's most prominent superstar performers. Without further ado, please welcome the marvelous Michael Braun, brother. Two, three. One, two, three. Hi, Michael. Hello, hello. How are you doing, sir? The Danny. It's awesome to meet you. Good to meet you too, sir. What an amazing life you've had. It it is from your point of view amazing. It's just the same old thing to me. And the the thing I would say at this point is that people sometimes freak out over this. You met this one, you made clothes for that one, you made art for this one, whatever. And what I would say to you is that it's just destiny, karma working out, whatever. I'd like to tell you how wonderful I am. It's BS. This is just fell in my lap. I was born a certain way with minimal talent, just art. And all the rest of the stuff in life, other than putting out the garbage, which I'm good at, I like to brag about. And I really may not be that good at garbage, but I think I'm good at garbage. Um is making art. I'm For 33 years, I made clothes for rock and rollers and wrestlers. But it just fell into my lap, meaning I was racing ocean racing sailboats and small sailboats, dinghies, that they race in the Olympics since I'm a little kid. Long story short, I bring an ocean racing sailboat to Florida, 1966, to race, um, meaning I'm just working on the boat as a laborer kind of person. And I dislocate my shoulder. The doctor says, don't go near a boat for a year. I'm in St. Petersburg at the yacht club, living on the boat, cleaning the boat, getting it ready for the Southern Circuit. I'm now living with, a, I meet a topless dancer. She says, oh, you can come live with me. Um, so I'm living now with four topless dancers in St. Petersburg, just off 49th Street. You left this part out of the documentary. Uh, okay. <laughs> where, did you meet to the to where did you meet the topless dancers? There was a, there was a topless club in St. Pete, and at the time, this was considered, like, how dare they have such a thing? You know, women walking around without tops on. This is like, you know, the, the newspapers went crazy with it. But anyway, it was a topless club. You know, regular bands are playing pop music. It's The place is filled up with men and women. And then there's two girls without their shirts on dancing to each song. One of them took a liking to me. She said I needed a place to live because I couldn't live on the boat anymore. And in the process, I meet a lady in the club. We start going out. Her name is Tony. She's my business partner for 33 years making clothes and very talented with clothes and very talented at running business, which I'm not so. Um, meaning all the paperwork stuff and, mm. and the ideas behind it, meaning she came up with an idea this is 1966, you're making clothes, get half down. So I'm making you a $100 pair of pants, you're giving me $50. Now you're invested in it. Um, and Macho Man, towards the end of us making clothes for him, had a $10,000 deposit with us, meaning we're making huge amounts of clothes. You know, I'm making an outfit a week. You know how many weeks there are in a year? 
from 800 to 2500 dollars a piece you know and he's wearing them you know sometimes some of the outfits there's no pictures of i never saw a picture hundreds of them there's pictures of but you and this is year after year after year but back to the beginning tony my business partner had a babysitter and a three-year-old son and whatever the babysitter heard you say he would go steal it so we once because we were poor we heard he heard us say the word flank steak or just the word steak i don't know what he heard he's working in a restaurant there's a big huge flank steak he wraps it up throws it in the garbage goes back after the place closed comes back to the house with the steak in his hand you know and he goes you know like look i got the thing you know and he heard us say sewing machine meaning i had done some show sewing before i altering my own clothes and making some things from scratch a bit just starting because i didn't have money always for the cool clothes that were available in greenwich village in new york so long story short we're playing this game he hears the word sewing machine he go he's working now at goodwill he steals even if you can put this in a sentence the word steal and goodwill together he steals from goodwill a sewing machine brings it back we start altering clothes and making clothes and fooling around and now we're going out each night we're walking to a club that was on 34th street and 5th avenue or four, between 4th and 5th avenue north and the people freaked out so this is 1968 there's no there's only pin straight clothes brooks brothers kind of clothes people see this stuff they lost their minds totally lost their minds now i end up making five nehru shirts so button up with the collar and all that stuff for a local band that's playing in this club called the blue room i sell five shirts for eighteen dollars i show the money to tony i said look we're rich look at my hands we're rich it's almost a hundred dollars we're rich you know think about it so we were just led into that now some months after that moron male ego okay you got that mm. i say to tony clean the house i'm gonna bring back the vanilla fudge who had a huge hit you keep me hanging on which was a supreme song and they did it in a psychedelic way <clears throat> i said i'm going to bring back the fudge they're playing on i think it's 38th avenue south there's a a place what's it called susan where the uh um military kind of place uh building like a vfw or something or a uh something like that anyway we're military, you know, it's a, just a it's big a room, big a, yeah, room. Yeah. That, so I go there, I follow the drummer, Carmine Apice, who was in the movie that you saw. I follow him into the dra uh, bathroom. I'd say I'm Michael Braun and stage clothes. Uh, and I make the mistake of saying, where do you get your clothes? And he said, hey, to Ashbury, Carnaby Street and the village. And I say, well, this is what we're making. What I have is way better than what he's wearing. I mean, way. I said, you want to come to our house after the gig? Fine. Three of the four guys came. They bought everything that remotely fit them and that we could alter for them. And then they wear it on Ed Sullivan, which is the show live Sunday night, 8 to 9, big deal, all kind of rock and roll people played that gig anyway now the public you know freaks out over the vanilla fudge the clothes are cool unbeknownst to me they're on the road with a new guitar player who's come from england named jimmy hendrix okay I meaning he's from seattle but 
He was in England. Now he comes to America. He's on the road with them. This is before he explodes. Jimmy says to Carmine, where'd you get the clothes? This is one sentence. Carmine says, our friends in Florida. I didn't know we were friends, meaning we made clothes for them, you know, but we're not hanging out. Um, Not that I wouldn't, but I'm just saying, he says, our friends in Florida. I go to see a record producer on First Avenue South, almost to 66th Street, a guy named Phil Gernhardt, who produced Abraham, Martin, and John, um, Snoopy versus the Red Baron, and Stay by Maurice Williams and the Zodiacs. So these are three huge records. I take all the clothes, I go to his office, small office, whatever, and I show him the clothes, and he says to me, listen, I'll tell Jimmy about you, but I'm not going to push you on to Jimmy. I don't want to upset him before the gig. He's an emotional guy. You know, it's nothing to me. I'm not getting anything out of this. So you call me Sunday afternoon, 4 o'clock. Sunday afternoon comes. It's 4 o'clock. I dial his number. He picks up the phone. He says, Michael, you're not going to believe this. Jimmy gets off the plane and says, where are the clothes people? Okay? So all I'm saying to you is that you could say, you know, in the language of our time, they'd say, oh, you were in the right place at the right time or, you know, this is just luck or whatever. Mm. This is destiny Mm. working out. This is just insanity, crazy. Now we end up making clothes for Jimmy and back to the beginning of what I was trying to say, and that is that so you have this person that has a little bit of creative talent for clothes, for art, for two-dimensional art. Um, but that's where his brain is. If you say to him, listen, I need you to be my lawyer. I committed this murder. Here's a million dollars in cash. Yes, I'm going to take your money. They're going to hang you. I got no ability to argue <laughs> whatsoever. You know, I mean, None. <clears throat> So, all I'm saying to you, I'm accepting how the game is going because I'm forced into it. So, you designing and making clothing, is this more of a thing that you're doing just to make money and survive? Or is this more of like a passion? Both. Both. Um, The survive thing, we're all carry some kind of a survival mentality with us as humans. And me hearing that my people were killed a lot in Europe and that my grandmother walked a year and a half before 1910, like around 1905, trying to get to America so that she could be free of the hate vibe, whatever the hate vibe was, whatever. I mean, I don't know the blow by blow because these people didn't talk about it but a man that lived across the street from me for a while in Tampa right near the stadium shows me a picture of a raft and in the raft is his wife his parents his two kids and a dog and a little motor I mean this is not this raft is maybe twice as big as this table maybe and I'm telling you, I'm a sailor. I wouldn't go across a pool that's 10 feet long that's six inches deep in this thing. And he comes from Cuba to America because he's looking to save his, the lives of his family and make them better, meaning he's driven by this. So I want to eat lunch and dinner at least. So I'm working. I need to make money, but I have a natural ability to make crazy stuff that people love. So I put those two things together. I mean, it's how I'm born, meaning I'm built that way. This is not, I wasn't like killing myself to like get my head into it. My head was into it. And 
the thing of making the clothes takes up your whole brain, meaning you're having to learn about how to make patterns, how to buy cloth, how cloth drapes, how cloth sews. Now you're into sewing machines. Now you're into buttonhole machines and embroidery machines and serging machines and how to keep them running and where to buy them. And this, each one of these things is a thing unto itself that could really fill up your brain, you know. And now, at 78 years old, and I didn't make clothes. I stopped making clothes in 2001. I walk into a room. I look at somebody, and I could tell you what, what the pattern looks like. I could draw the pattern for whatever it is they're wearing. I don't care what it is. Man, woman, dog, doesn't matter. I could draw it. I could tell you what machines were used. I could tell you why this this fabric, the dye didn't stay in it, the way it was washed, all that crap. It's meaningless, meaning why I'm even thinking about it. You know, I could tell you how brassiers are made, panties are made, you know, stuff that you're going, Mike, you got some other place to put your mind, you know. Meaning this is just craziness, but it's the mechanics of doing that thing. The same with computers. I'm painting art in a computer, and I'm making small pieces and huge pieces, and none of it looks like anything that you know, meaning I'm not drawing palm or trees. Abstract stuff. It's abstract, and people die over it and say, how did you get this? And, and they say, how did you go from making clothes to doing this abstract art? You know, and I'm saying it's the same thing. I'm painting a human on a stage with patterns, fabrics, sewing machine, whatever. Mm. It's what I'm doing. This is the exact same thing, except no one's saying to me, I got Madison Square Garden in a week and a half, and it's got to be blue, and it can't be more than $2,000 or $1,000 or whatever. Or Jimmy is saying to me in a letter, anything you come across, don't be hesitant to make something, anything, to your fancy, as long as it's specially made as art, period. That's in the middle of the letter. Especially made as art. What did he mean by that? I talked to him. You know, what he's talking to, this is two humans communicating in English, but he's got his version of English, how he calls things. I made a shirt for him, and it's in... Life magazine, where I use three squares of Velcro. In the letter, he says, try to match the color of the sticky-type buttons to the color of the shirt or as close as possible. In the meantime, Velcro just came out. He never heard the word Velcro, hmm. for sure. It just came out then. They only made it in white, but he called it sticky-type buttons. What <laughs> you and I have on our heads, he calls them ear goggles. That's just how he talks. You understand what I'm Did saying? Did he really call them ear goggles? <laughs> really? Uh, do wow. I, could I make this up? <laughs> I guess not. That's pretty <laughs> fucking amazing. So what I'm saying to you is that he knew by seeing the clothes that we showed him in the beginning, then we made him clothes. Now we're making clothes for him every three to four months. I'm sending him a whole wardrobe, shirts, pants, jackets, scarves, armbands. Now he's writing me letters, to this letter to say, I need more of this, I need one of this. And more unusual sleeves. So mm. at one point. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Blue Blocks. For a long time, I've had trouble sleeping through the night. And I literally tried everything from supplements, smoking pot, meditating. And at the end of the day, all that stuff was was just a Band-Aid. Blue Blocks actually fixed this problem for me with their super high-tech lenses. Blue light from our phones and computers actually damage our eyes and lead to digital eye strain. You get symptoms like blurred vision, headaches, and the worst of all, you can't fucking sleep. Unlike other blue light glasses, Blue Blocks are backed by science and they're made in an optical laboratory in Australia. Most other blue light blocking companies are mass producing their shit in China with no understanding of how light impacts health. They have over 40 frames that come in prescription, non-prescription, and even readers. I keep mine literally right next to my computer all day, every day. I even use them on some of the podcasts. The podcast that I do late at night, I always use these. You can actually wear these things and not look like a freaking geek. Do I look cute? Get your energy back, sleep better, and block out all that unhealthy blue light with Blue Blocks. Get 20% off by going to blueblocks.com slash concrete. B-L-U-B-L-O-X 
concrete.com slash K-O-N-C-R-E-T-E for 20% off or just use the code concrete at checkout. He shows me we're in the Sheridan Hotel downtown Tampa. It's towards the beginning. And he shows me a sleeve that instead of being small, it's maybe this big. You know, Mike, he's not playing with a full deck, the poor thing. So how does he cut it? Are you talking about yourself? Yes. Okay. How does he cut it? He cuts it from the armpit to way out here, way this much. You'll see hundreds of pictures on the net of this. And he's using, and then six inch ruffles along the edge. He's buying this fabric. This is silk chiffon and then all other kind of silks and stuff. But he's buying this fabric in St. Petersburg and in Tampa in the fancy ladies' fabric store. He's walking in with hair out to his shoulders into a thing that only women go into. (laughs) Men aren't going to buy fabric to take the fabric to their seamstress to make a gown for their whatever party that they're going to to show off. So all I'm saying to you is that Jimmy, he knew without any words that I got what he was doing. I'm starting to make clothes for him. He's freaking out. He loves it. But what does Jimmy always want? More. Money mean nothing to him. He doesn't even know what you're talking about. Never heard of money mean nothing. You know, it's past money. Way past money. So you guys never discussed money? Never. Never. Not once? Never. Are you kidding me? No. He would just say, go to them and get the check or, you know, whatever. How how did you figure out how much to charge him? Ah, now you're into Tony Ackerman. So Tony... In the early days, we would come up with a price. Here's, you know, crushed velvet pants. They didn't have crushed velvet in those days, so we crush it ourselves, and we're doing fabric-covered buttons, and he's wearing these pants at Woodstock, okay? Aqua. Front seam pants, so the pants are tight to the knee. And then if you look from the side, that it's coming down like this, then it gets wider as it comes to your foot, so it's going out to the toe of your shoe Mm. and then to your heel. Um, He sees what we're doing. He just wants more. Um, He knows these people. He knows Tony. He knows Michael. They're just about making clothes that are cool. That's the... There's no thing... You know, I don't need you know, whatever, autographs or mean nothing to me. And Jimmy, just as an aside, says to my little Italian business partner, this is maybe 1968 or 9. Talking about Tony. Talking about Tony. Women are having sex with me just to say they had sex with Jimi Hendrix, meaning I wasn't in the room when he told her this story. He's talking to her because he can talk to her as a human. And he's getting something off his chest, which is a hurt. Hmm. And he says to her, women are having sex with me just to ha- say that I had sex with Jimi Hendrix. I'm 26 and a moron. So my reaction is, well, if there's a problem, me and the boys can help fill in the blanks. We don't want anyone's feelings to be hurt. Meaning it's just stupidity. Then I figured it out afterwards in the years that went by and women's libs started to happen that this is insulting to Jimmy, very insulting, meaning they just want a piece of him. They were stealing the clothes. When he says to me in this letter, dear couple, I need clothes expresso. Send whatever you have immediately. And I'm thinking, dude, who the hell do you think you're talking to? This is Mike. I'm, I just sent you whole wardrobe who that you know what the hell's wrong with you then mike figures out what's going on what's going on is that the girls are stealing the clothes that's number one number two he's splitting the clothes i'm using silk and rayon rayon velvet that i'm talking about meaning this is rayon velvet so Rayon? Rayon. How do you spell that? <laughs> R-A-Y-O-N. Okay. You're asking the wrong person about <laughs> spelling anything. But that, that one I knew. That's nice. Um, Can so, I touch it? Yes, yes, yes. So Rayon Velvet, wow. when it I'm making tight pants for a rock and roll guy 
who drops his ass down to the ground holding the guitar in front of him. This rayon velvet, this is meant for a proper lady's gown. End of story. This is not rock and roll. There's right. nothing rock and roll. And But now we're back to the thing about that we were talking about knowing the specifications of all these different fabrics. So rayon, different colors run different ways. That's number one. From perspiration, from washing. You know, you, get, you, you give someone a rayon shirt that's red, you know, and it's a drummer. His body's going to be red at the end of the... This one's uh, not rayon. <laughs> that's cotton. Um, anyway, all I'm saying to you is that rayon, at the end of its... As you start to stretch it to its the end of its life, it'll just split. It'll just split. You'll have a foot-long split in the thing. Mm -hmm. He was splitting the pants. I never knew this. He never says it to me ever. He just says in the letter, try to double-stitch the pants. Mm. Right? That's what he's saying. Right. Now, just as, and again, an aside, maybe four or five years after Jimmy dies, Robin Trower, who we're making clothes for, really known guitar player, is playing in Lakeland. I go there. This is a proper English guy, not into drugs, you know, whatever. Um, very proper. And cool. We go there. He plays. We delivered some clothes. Anyway, he now, he and I and a couple of the roadies go out for dinner after the gig. One of the guys is a guy named Jerry Stickles. This is Jimmy's roadie from the beginning. The beginning. And what I'm saying to you about Rhodey is that this guy will do whatever it takes to save whatever the situation is that's going on with whoever he's working for. This is the no fool around kind of thing. This is not just someone setting up the microphones. This is his whole life is devoted to let's save Jimmy who just got in a car accident or did this or got caught with that, you know, whatever the thing is. He's the, the parachute when shit goes wrong. <laughs> okay, that's a way of saying it. Parachute says it all. So Jerry's there with us, and he says that, or he tells this story, that Jimmy, um, I forgot where I was. Wait a second. You, you were meeting them at dinner or something? Yeah, and, yeah and so Jerry Stickles is there, and he tells this story. <clears throat> that Jimmy is playing gig in Seattle. That's his home. It's a revolving stage. Mm. Jimmy drops his ass down to the ground with his guitar in front of him, splits the pants. They throw him an English Union Jack flag. Okay? He ties it on him like a diaper, two knots on his hip. Is the way I understand it. I never saw a picture of it. And the gig goes on. All I'm saying to you is that that's why Jimmy's saying to me, try to double stitch the pants. You know, as the years went on, I learned, well, you can't use this fabric on that human being because he can split it. He doesn't wear underwear, right? That's the, that's the legend. No underwear, baby. <laughs> no underwear. Oh, Jesus. Could you imagine? Can you imagine? Seeing that happen. <laughs> Can you imagine? Um, and this is, no, no one's going to believe you. I'm going to tell you this thing, and you're going to go, eh, Mike, you don't know what he's talking about. <clears throat> they say, well, what was he like? This is quiet, shy, introvert, mm. very well-mannered. I believe it. You know, but everybody else says, I don't believe it. That's not what I'm seeing in the music. That's not mm. what I'm hearing. All I'm saying to you is that his art, as it came out of him, is what you're seeing, the poetry part of it. I'm just going to talk about poetry, which I know nothing about. <clears throat> I walk into a room. He's there. He says to me, oh, you got to read this great poetry book, some known poetry book. 
I'm thinking, hey, dude, this is Mike over here. What are you talking about poetry? I'm into, you know, being masculine. You know, me and I'm being silly. But I'm going, what the hell are you even talking about? Poetry? Who the hell are you thinking? What? Poetry? But he was way into that. And what Bob Dylan was writing was heavy, heavy, heavy poetry. What Jimmy's writing when he's talking about um, Wind Cries Mary or, mm -hmm. you know, all those kind of songs where, you know, he's talking about you can see happiness staggering on down the street, footprints dressed in red. He's telling a story from his point of view in his mind. He's talking about this and... He knows that this is like very shocking to the society, meaning I'm on the phone with him once. I'm calling him from New York. I mean, I'm in New York with him. I'm calling Tony and I'm saying, what about this? What about that? We do our business that we had to do at that moment. And I say, uh, Tony sends her regards or her love or whatever. And Jimmy says, tell her I'll meet her in the next world and don't be late. Meaning, this is Jimmy. This is in his song, but he's living in another place that you and I can't imagine. Right. You get a clue of it by his music. And you say, oh, this is some cool place. <clears throat> but back to sort of the beginning. Yeah, uh, talking about his personality, I, personally, some of the most talented people that I know or have ever met have been very socially awkward and introverted like that. I wouldn't say he's socially awkward. I would just say introverted, quiet, shy, mm. um, very well-mannered, and he knows how to get through a situation, whatever it is. Mm. Meaning, you know, in his hotel room, in downtown Tampa in the Sheridan, there's a paper bag on the, you know, little table there. I didn't think anything of it. You know, we're doing the clothes and we're taking the order and this and that. And and this is at the first time we're meeting him. And I say, oh, let's figure out your size. Try these pants on. <clears throat> Meaning I could just look at him in one second. I could tell you what size he is. I give him the pants. He walks over towards the bathroom. There's one of those thin tables by the bathroom. And he takes off the scarves that are tied around his waist, which this is like a two-minute job, I meaning he's got knots of scarves going around his waist and around his waist, just what he's doing at the time. It's just what he's wearing? Yeah, yeah, over his pants. Okay. He's wearing scarves, and he's tying the scarves around his knees and, you know, right. all that stuff that you see. Anyway. He takes it off, lays it on this table, takes the pants, goes into the bathroom. Two minutes later, he comes back out with his original pants on. And he's got the pants that I gave him to try on. He says, make them all like this. Meaning he's saying, don't measure me, don't touch me, whatever. Make them all like this. Mm. Fine. Meaning he's shy. And those pants fit them, but these are tight pants, and they're tight partially because they're seen down the front and back, and I can get away with it, meaning we're getting known for this look of these pants with the buttons down the side and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but all I'm saying to you is that he could get through a situation later on in that day after he played. Now, myself, you know, a few other guys and girls or whatever are back at his room after the gig you know the the reefers being rolled we're smoking it you know half an hour goes by and everyone's looking around they're hungry you know someone takes out a piece of paper and tries to take an order mm -hmm. you want a burger from the whatever downstairs or fries the first person tries to do it, they can't write, they can't even spell their own name, meaning they're too high. Second person too high, third person too high. Finally, Jimmy says, give me the pet. He takes it. He asks, do you want a burger? you want it medium? you want fries? you want this? you want a Coke? you want... He had to have been 
a waiter at some point in his life or he knew about this stuff. He wasn't ashamed of it or anything like that. This is what it took to do the job. He says, give me the paper. And he wrote, writes, gets the whole thing written out. They went and got the food. We ate the food. That was the end of that. But all I'm saying to you is that it's a very natural person. And that's what's coming across when he's telling me, don't be hesitant to take and make something, anything to your fancy as long as it's specially made as art. He's telling me, Mike, go for it. Mm -hmm. Just go and enjoy it. Just go right. and make it. Don't worry about the money. Don't worry about the time. Don't worry <clears throat> about Jimi Hendrix. Don't worry about anything. Just go make some art and then send it to me and make a lot. Um, so all I'm saying to you is that this is a lesson in life of this is just another person with all the things that you have he may have a different set of talents and a different way of operating a little bit but and obviously a very different destiny so far in, in your life anyway um but all i'm saying to you is that he knew how to communicate on a record he knew how to communicate with some fool that's making his clothes in tampa you know or st petersburg at the time um so there's a beauty to just being natural. That's really what he was, you know, right. where a lot of us feel as though, you know, I can't be natural. I'm not, I, I got to play this part. That's what the culture is telling me is proper or cool or, yeah. you know, whatever. Right. You know, and what he's saying, just go for it, Mike. Yeah. You know, do what you do. Right. That's why he chose you. So going back to, you were shipping all of these outfits to him wherever he was. You were how many how many outfits were you making for him in a month? Like fifty? You know, no. I would say maybe twenty. Twenty? Yeah. And and there was and some of the, these women were just stealing them from him and he had no idea? No, no, he had an idea. He knew they were stealing them. Um But the women would queue up to be with him. Right. They would, you know, let's say we're in the hotel, we're doing clothes, or we're hanging out afterwards. People are coming to the door, knocking on the door. I want an autograph. I want to meet Jimmy, whatever. You know, and I got to say, listen, we're working. You know, you do what you got to do, but you only got five minutes. Get it done. Um, and some of the girls you let in, particularly one girl that we let in that Susan knew, the next morning, she was there for five minutes and left, whatever. The next morning, she's there when we come, meaning she had spent the night. She came after we left late, and then she was there in the morning. Is this in Tampa? This is in Tampa. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this girl. I'm just saying to you that this is... you. If I say to you, well, here's 500 girls. They all want to sleep with you. You go, uh, that's a little overwhelming. Can I have two <laughs> <laughs> or three? You right, know, right, you know, I right. Mean, I mean, can we stretch this out <laughs> over a week or How long a month? do I have? <laughs> yeah, yeah, long. But I mean, and I'm saying to you, and you can hear him say it in between songs where he's saying, <clears throat> he, this is dedicated to the girl in the seventh row with the red underwear. This is the girl with the chrome uh, knee pads. You know, you'll hear it in between the songs on yeah. that he's talking. He's just thanking people or talking to people or saying whatever's on his mind at the moment. Um, I like to thank you for the last three years. He said three things to me about the end. One of which is, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be doing what I'm doing. I'm going, uh, this sounds... What, what is the context yeah. of this? Like, are you guys... This is out of nothing. This you guys are hanging out, eating dinner, where you're, you're traveling we're with walking. him. I think we were walking somewhere. He said, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be doing what I'm doing. I'm going, first of all, I don't like this. Second of all, I don't know what it really means. Third of all, I'll do what Mike does. Who And Mike's not very smart. He just shove it under the carpet. Let's forget it. Let's blow it off. Then he says... I don't know how much longer I'm going to be needing clothes. I'm 
I'm going, what are we talking about here? What's, what's going on? The third thing, I forgot what it is. I forgot mm. five or ten years ago what it was. Mm. He knew the end was coming, okay? And he was saying it to me. Um, and he was here in St. Pete for maybe four days just before he died. Within, really? Yeah, yeah, just before, t two weeks before he died, or weeks before he died, let's say. He had played the High Life Fronton in Miami. We went there. We brought him back. He stayed at this this place, I'm telling you, the Blue Room, which was a motel that they've just recently torn down on 34th Street. But my point is, is that he knew what was coming, and even though he's trying to say it to me, I'm not listening to anything he says. And he's very human. It's a very human person, whatever that means. He's staying in this hotel. He's getting up at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. That's oh, the, afternoon. <laughs> that's the wake-up time. Okay, so he's getting up at 4 o'clock, and we're going to eat right next to this place called the Blue Room in those days. Mm -hmm was a place where you just line up to get the food. Um, what do you call it, Susan? Morrison. Morrison. Morrison's Cafeteria. So proper people in St. Petersburg, this is 1970, 1969, <clears throat> um, probably 1970. So you go out, and this is a proper place to go with the family, with your wife, Morrison's Cafeteria. And you line up mm. and you say, I want that, I want that. You're pointing to it. And the people have got the spoons and they put it on your plate, they put it on your plate. And now, Jimmy's first in line, I'm second, Tony's there, and I think Elena. The people that are spooning the fur food say to me with their mouths but not their voices, is that Jimi Hendrix? <laughs> you know, they're pointing and they're going, is that Jimi Hendrix? Like, this is Jimi Hendrix. He's in Morrison's cafeteria at 5 o'clock. Like, what the hell are you even talking about? How could, this is impossible. I mean, he's very famous at this point. Um, so all I'm saying to you is that we go to Morrison's, we eat, you know. Or if you go to any club anywhere with him, they always invite him to play. He'll always play. Always. Mm -hmm. Always. You know, he may say, I need this kind of guitar or turn the amp, amp around. I want it to be louder. You know, you don't know what he'll say, but he's looking to play. This is where he's living in his head, in his heart. Or Jimmy, myself, Tony, and a few other people are watching a movie on television, and it's a movie about wolves that raise a baby mm. okay mm -hmm. it's an old old movie and we're watching it and the wolves are raising the baby doing this whatever they're doing there might be foxes i don't even know and so we're watching it just properly and we see we glance over to jimmy jimmy's playing an air guitar in his head he's playing along with the music in this thing in this movie this is where his head is at he's playing you know then he realizes we see what is he's doing you know and he then he starts tuning his elbow you know i mean he makes it into a joke but all i'm saying to you is that all of these people musician types macho man same thing these people are totally taken up with whatever game they're playing it's a hundred percent of their being hundred I mean, Macho Man, Miss Elizabeth complained about this. Gorgeous George complained about it. They're there getting clothes in this in our shop, and this is like a <clears throat> it's a huge house on South Bayshore Boulevard on the water, six thousand square feet, and a hundred and two acres of land, hundred and fifty feet from the center line of Bayshore is now servants' quarters, six-car garage and servants' quarters. 
You're going servants' quarters. What are you even talking? I never even heard of this. This is 1927. That's what you did. You had servants and mm. you had a place for them to live. So we're using this as our shop. This is a concrete floor, you know, 30 foot by 30 foot room. Upstairs is an apartment to rent and there's long rooms on either side. One room is just a, a cutting room, you know, is a, a huge table, very long, that we're cutting fabric. Um, into garments on and all I'm saying to you is that the the playing the game with Randy all the girls complained my way of saying it he's never off ever no he, he's working all the time day and night this wears people out because they're used to having off time he never heard of off times he doesn't even know what you mean by off time um this is a very hard working person and the other funny thing about him and making clothes for him is that he has no visual sense whatsoever <laughs> so I'm not saying it as an insult or a compliment or anything. It's just here's a statement of fact. He doesn't have this. You say to Michael, can you spell? Michael says no. He does, he's not born with that. You know. And can he write down a, a telephone number twice? Yeah, probably not. He's got to really look at it very, very carefully, and hopefully it's an 813 area code <laughs> or 727, so he's got the first three numbers. But... This is not his thing. He he just he's not born with this. He has to really work at it mm. to spell something or I mean, Susan is tortured, I have to say. How do you spell gone? And so it's G O N E, but it looks wrong to me. Hmm. I'm you know, this is just something in your head. So you got something great over here, <clears throat> you got nothing over here. So right. you're doing the best you can with the parts you got. So Randy comes to me. I get a call. I'm, first of all, I'm not watching wrestling. I don't know about wrestling. I know it's on television. How? Let's pause for a second. How far after your um, relationship with Jimmy, like obviously he passed away and you stopped working for him. What was it like? Well, first of all, what was it like when you found out Jimmy first passed away? Like, Where were you and, and how... I was sleeping, they came and woke me up, and they said, Jimmy's dead. So I'm new at this game. I'm going, what are you talking about? He was just here. I mean, he was here like for four days. We had picked him up in Miami, brought him back, mm -hmm. took him here, took him there. I Meaning, I'm not getting it. I'm saying, what do you mean? He was just here. You know, what are you telling me? Jimmy's dead. I couldn't get it. Um... And then they said he's in England, he died, he overdosed, or whatever they think it was, or, you know, he's dead. Then I had to try to absorb this, but I had lost my birth mother at maybe four. So I was forced into learning, A, people die, people in your family can die, this is how life goes, deal with it dude and from there to this day I have maybe five mothers meaning in my mind I think they're mothers to me you know my father married <clears throat> after my first mother died a lady from Canada beautiful raised me and all that stuff in my heart she's my mother mm. But we had a beautiful, phenomenal maid, that's what they called him in those days, named Arlene, black lady from Brooklyn, Brooklyn Dodgers fan, you know, so I could only love the Dodgers. I loved Arlene. This is my mother, mm. meaning she took care of me. I'm a little kid. End of story, you know. Right. I love Arlene. <laughs> it's nothing to even say here. Words don't do it. And the beauty of that is that you're learning how life goes, but you're getting what's meant for you. This is a lesson you got to learn in life. 
people can die. You can love anybody. If you want to love them special, we're going to tell them or they're going to play the part of being your mother and then you get triple love or quadruple love, you know, whatever the thing is. I mean, and there's a lady that I know to this day that lives in Texas that's my mother. She's younger than me. You're going, Michael, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> Somebody says, this is your mother. They said it to me, you know, maybe 40 years ago. I treated her that way. She's married to a, a, a friend of mine. You know, but in my mind, she's my mother. If she tells me drink echinacea tea, then I'm going, oh, I got to drink echinacea tea because my mother told me to. You know, this is, I'm just telling you, this is how the mind works. This yeah. is a wild thing. And <clears throat> about Randy... He calls me on the phone. I had made for Hulk, Hulk Hogan, made close for him. He was a bass player in a local band in Tampa called Ruckus. And this I mean, is, how, how long is this after Jimmy passes away? Um, I'm not going to answer because I'm really bad on time. Okay. But, but um, I, can't, I, I don't know what to say, but probably not terribly long. Uh -huh. um, and are these guys, are these star, like people like Hulk Hogan, are they reaching out to you because... No, no, no. This is just, this is what's going on. This is what we're doing for a living. Mm -hmm. There's, let's say, in the eastern United States, or the middle to the eastern United States, there's, let's say there's 200 bands that is made up of people from 18 to 35 years old, that go around and play two weeks in this club, two weeks in that club, two weeks in that club, anywhere from Indiana and Illinois and all those kind of places all through Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida. So they come and play two weeks. They hear, oh, there's some crazy people that make wild clothes that made Jimi Hendrix's clothes, if you're into name dropping. Oh, and they make clothes for, you know, whoever. I mean, they go through the whole thing, share. And... So they'd come for clothes, would make them clothes, and they needed sometimes matching clothes and what fit their music, whatever they were doing. Um, so we're making clothes for them, and just this band comes. It's from Tampa called Ruckus. There's a, a real tall guy in the band. I don't think anything of it. We just make the clothes and the story. He's the bass player. Then... He becomes a famous wrestler, unbeknownst to me. He started in Tampa. They were rough on him physically. He went to Japan. They made him, they paired him with a Japanese wrestler and put his name or the name of whatever they were on the lunch boxes for the little kids in Japan. He was a big star in Japan. <clears throat> now he comes back to America, and this is at the time Vince McMahon, who owns the WWF, and now it's the WWE, but WWF at the time, he's now taking all these individual sections of the country and making one television show mm -hmm. that does... You know, it's 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 not before just, him. It was Ted Turner, right? Uh, I don't know who before it was. the WWE before Vince McMahon took over. Vince McMahon Senior. First of all, Vince McMahon that you know now is is the third generation. His father did wrestling and boxing promoting in New England area, so New right. York, Connecticut, mm -hmm. New Hampshire, whatever <laughs> that. Um, he. With the help of Hulk, supposedly, put this thing together where they did all, that brought all the wrestlers together and mm -hmm. started to do shows on television. Right. I don't know about this. I, I just know that I could, that I have a remote and I go around. I see sometimes there's people doing the wrestling thing. I got no interest in this thing. <laughs> but I hear, he calls me on the phone one day and says, listen, I'm going to be on Johnny Carson. I need clothes. You, can you make me some clothes? I said, well, we sew every day, you know. <laughs> can I make you clothes? Yeah. You know, meaning he lived in South Tampa we, where we lived with his parents. And he, we made the clothes for Johnny Carson and then ended up making, you know, more clothes for him. What was the outfit he made for Johnny Carson? No idea. You don't remember? Not, not, no, I have no idea. Um, 
a shirt and a pair of pants, but I don't know what it was. Wasn't it uh, all denim? Um, Aiden, can you look up Hulk Hogan, Johnny Carson, find a picture of it or a video of it? I don't know. I don't think so. I, I would doubt that it's denim, but God knows. Um, he may have been on Johnny Carson with a denim oh, outfit. Oh, might we, have been a different time. Yeah, maybe right. it's a different time. But in, <clears throat> in any event, now I get a call from somebody. I don't know who this is. This is Macho Man. I don't know who this is. And I get the call. I pick up my phone. And, says, and Macho Man says, hey, the Hulkster told me you can make me some clothes. I'm holding the phone out. I'm like, who in the hell is this? What the the hell Hulkster is? told me. <laughs> the Hulkster told me you could make me, you know, in his heavy voice. <clears throat> I have no idea who this person is. I said, well, we saw every day. Come on. Come tomorrow. You know, we're here noon to six. Give him the address, whatever. Next day comes with Elizabeth, and he's got little shorts that have three stars across the front. And then maybe two inch letterings across his tush says Macho Man. You know, I said, dude, I'm not making shorts and I need real estate. I need it from the ground to past your head, but I'm not making shorts. This is not me. I need, you know, you're asking me to make clothes. I'll make you some clothes, but this is not it. Anyway. He couldn't get to that. He says, well, I made a lot of money with this and this and that, and he wants capes. I said, dude, I'm not a cape guy. Right. You come to me and you say, listen, I need, a, a, I need a gown for my daughter that's getting married. It's $20,000. I'll pay you. you know, and then we got the bridesmaids. They're $15,000. You know, am I going to take your money? You know I'm going to take your money. Yes. <laughs> B, Roman numeral true. Michael, he doesn't wear dresses. He doesn't think about dresses. He doesn't think about weddings. He got no idea what you're talking about. This whole women's wedding. What the hell are you even? I got nothing. I'm nobody home. But I can go buy Modern Bride. I can just look at a picture. I can go draw the thing. I'll make the first one, and the sewers will make the ones after that. And the story, here's your $20,000 gown. But you're not getting the best from Mike because Mike has no idea what you're talking about. I mean, none. Um, so Randy, I make him a few outfits to just get him started. Now he comes to the shop again, puts his head down. He says, you can make anything you want. This is the kiss, kiss of death to say to someone creative, mm. do whatever you want and not even put a price on it or a time, anything, something. You can do whatever you want. I make him five outfits. And this is him telling me the story. I make him the five outfits, and he tells me he wears his, the one that he really likes. He never told me he didn't like anything, ever. Which he had to have not liked something, or didn't get something, or didn't realize something was as cool you know, that I thought it was cool, and it turned out that the public thought it was cool. He didn't think it was cool, but then he got into it that they liked it. Um, so now he tells this story that he's got the five outfits. He wears his favorite outfit on Monday Night Raw, and that's the second week, third week. Now we're up to the fifth week. He doesn't say he wore the outfit that he didn't like, but it's the fifth week. It's the purple outfit with the chains. I said, okay. I'm listening to the story, and he's trying to paint a picture for me. Purple outfit with the chains. He says, I put on the outfit in a separate dressing room. I walk out of the dressing room. Now I'm in the main room where all the boys are. These are like old ladies who play Marjan, these wrestlers, <laughs> meaning you can only lift weights, you can only travel, and you can only travel, and you can only, um, you can only lift weights travel and wrestle so much then the rest you just gossip mm -hmm. you know so and so did this you know you got 20 guys sitting around a room with nothing to do they gossip and this is before cell phones so they just gossip he walks out of the room they all turn they go wow where'd you get that that's great he's going this is the one i didn't like uh, i thought this is nothing they freaked out now he's walking down the aisle, he, down the corridor, he tells me. Vince McMahon's coming the other way. Vince stops him and says, 
the hell is that? That's great. Wow, where'd you get it? Now he's going, wow, now I'm really in trouble. Now Vince loves it. Now he tells me he's standing in the opening to walk out to the ring. He walks through the opening. They put the spotlight on him. He said, and it really pops. This is his word. Really pops, and he really gets over, meaning he does well. Right. Connecting to the audience that night. Really got over, brother. Exactly. And all I'm saying to you is that he was telling me he has no idea what the hell I'm doing, but go for it. And another time, and another time, meaning I'm making probably 45 outfits a year at 800 to $2,500 a piece. And everyone <clears throat> in the documentary on A&E said that Randy was really cheap and he wouldn't buy a cup of coffee and this and that. He never mentioned money. I just told him, you know, Tony came up with, you know, get a deposit. So we got the $4,000 deposit to begin with, you know, and that worked for a while. And then she said, you got to go up to 10 grand, Mike, get another six. You know, whatever she tell me I would do, meaning she could see this thing from a outsider's point of view, from this is strictly business. And you said, how do you know the price mm. when we first started to talk? She and I made a list. How much fabric is in it? How long did it take to buy the fabric? How long did it take to design it? How long did it take to make the pattern? How long did it take to cut it? What was Vera's price to put the thing together? Um, how much time to paint it? How much time to make the pattern for the painting? Macho man, macho man, macho man. How much for the glitter? How much for the paint? You know, on and on and on. And... <clears throat> So we'd go through that long list of stuff. And this is when we first started to fool around with computers. Um, that's Susan's fault, totally. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about 1996. And so I made this piece of paper that you would write in. It took uh, an hour and a half to cut it. It took this much to buy the fabric. This is what the fabric cost. Here's Vera. Here's whatever. Anyway, as we're doing it, we're figuring out that this is what's going on. But then we also said, Tony would sometimes say is, does it look like it's, you know, $2,500 or $2,000 or $1,000? I'd say, eh, it comes out to 1500 but it looks like it's really, you know, twelve, Or it comes out to twelve, but we should charge 1800 You You understand what I'm mm, saying. Mm -hmm. um, but it all meant nothing to him except to say he says to me in the shop we're alone it's a 30 foot by 30 foot room concrete floor as i said this thread everywhere fabric everywhere clothes being made <clears throat> patterns hanging fabric on rolls under this table under that table on hanging on this shelf and that shelf and whatever it's i mean just there's nothing fancy about this it's just business and his point of view on this game is that we're doing the best that we can. He sees that we're making a huge effort. He says to me, just out of nowhere, I'm small. I'm a big mouth, as you see, and I'm looking around like, what the hell, do, how do I answer this question? <laughs> His arm is bigger than both of my thighs together. Right. What do I say? Did he mean that he was short? You figured it out. See, I didn't figure it out. I didn't even get this. I think, what the hell is he talking about? I don't know what he's talking about. I'll just leave it alone. I say nothing. Then, like a week later, WWF comes to wrestle at the university in Tampa. I go there. I go up into the balcony. And I look... What are they seeing? Meaning, I'm trying to see what is the audience seeing, and I'm taking pictures of every outfit we make of Randy's. I tell them, go outside. I take a few pictures mm -hmm. from the front, from the side, from the back. <laughs> Meaning, I want to say ink on paper. What does it look like? What does this outfit actually look like? Jeez. Wow. So, 
So these is uh, 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 so absurd. <laughs> you said the right thing, brother. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 amazing the the amount of just Go. creativity that you put into this. Where are you coming up with these these ideas? <laughs> like like what what? Hold your thought one second. So continuing, continuing. So what I'm saying to you is that we're going to come back to this thing, but where was I? Tricks. Hold well, uh, Pause one second. I'm going to turn the AC back on. It, okay. turned on, it popped off. <clears throat> hey, no luck with finding that picture, huh? I, no. looked, I looked myself and all I found was something where he, I didn't know he was with Rocky. All I have was the pictures that <clears throat> we're going to talk about Slim Jim a little hold, bit. Yeah, so when further, uh, when when, uh, when you're like hold these up next to your microphone, that way they'll they'll be in focus and we can see them uh, on the camera. And you know, when, when you're referring to them, at least. Okay. Um. All I'm saying to you is that I'm trying to see what the audience is seeing. With a virgin eye, meaning I'm just 18 years old. You know, my friend says, well, I got free tickets to go to wrestling. Let's go see it. Or let's sit down and watch this thing. You know, I walked, I saw it on TV. You know, what is it? What I'm saying back to you is that I'm trying to get to the place that is in the beginning. You just see this thing. You don't know who made the clothes. You don't know who the wrestler is. You don't know what's going on. You're just going around the channels, and you want to see, does this stand out compared to whatever the show is that you're watching, whatever the car commercial is that you're watching? What do you get out of this? You know, <clears throat> so you're getting this is some crazy wrestler wearing some cool clothes. This is really cool. What the hell is this? Where did it come from? Who thought of this? How did this even come about? But all I'm saying to you is that the world just gets, wow, this is cool. This is unbelievable. What is this? Is, you know, he, is this like a, a, most of these looks that he's wearing? He's got the hat. He's always got the iconic hat shape, and he's always got the long the long tassels hanging off fringe. the arms. Okay. It's like a cowboy pimp, okay. right? Okay, no. So let's go back. You got to remember about where we were, but I'll do this part now. Okay. <clears throat> He's wearing glasses. I say, oh, let's make, let's put some crap on the glasses and make them crazy that the macho man would wear. So I start putting all the stuff on the glasses and I'm working on glasses. Then he says to me, Listen, uh, they made me the macho king, and I got to wear a crown, mm. and he doesn't like it. I said, okay. He says, I need something else for my head, but let's get it. I don't want to wear this crown anymore that they gave me. I said, fine. We go to Ybor City. There's a proper men's hat store mm. with every kind of hat you could think of, English bowler, you know, just all kind of things through history, every different kind of hat you could imagine. And there's cowboy hats there, too. And I say, oh, the shape of the cowboy hat's good on them. Let's see this. And so we try this, try that. Now we end up with straw hats. You know, I'm buying them by the dozen um, in his size, and I'm painting them. And I'm having them covered with fabric. Um, I'm doing all kind of crazy stuff. Or... I'm, ha I'm painting them, and then I'm making a band that goes around them. But what I'm saying to you is that the other wrestlers, let's say Jake the Snake, he's got one snake, one costume. That's the deal. You know, you see it next year, it's the same thing. Randy, you're seeing some crazy-ass outfit every single week, and the outfits fit this character. You can't say why. I don't, can't give you the words, but it fits this character. And I'm making the clothes, 
and he's getting over with the clothes. When he's saying to me, I'm small, what I'm saying to you is when he came out of that dressing room, now he's with the boys. If the boys are standing up, he's just what you said, short compared to the big show, Andre the Giant, whatever, Hulk. Yeah. They're all taller than him. Right. So, but his personality is much stronger than theirs. His macho mania craze thing where he's living in that place. This is not, you know, he's living there. Mm -hmm. And his mother, his proper Jewish mother, who comes with him sometimes, the mother and father come. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How old was he? When you were when you guys were doing I this? I don't know. I'm bad on time. I'd have to sit and think about it. You're wasting your time asking me about that. <laughs> I mean, I got no thing on years. Right, right. But the mother comes and she said and brings the dog and the father's there, whatever. You know, he's having to come like every two, three weeks, you know, and they want to see what he's doing or mm. whatever. The mother's the one who's came up with the name Macho Man. Oh really? Yeah. Oh really. Um it's a proper Jewish lady, and she says to me that he, as a high school kid, would get up really early in the morning, go practice, whether it's baseball or football or soccer or what, you know, I don't know, I don't know what they're playing. But he, and then he'd come back home, clean up, go to school, but he was like so intensely into this and didn't fool around with the girls. He was working the whole time. Now and again, a little bit with the girls, but he was working hard, hard, hard. And I'm saying to you that Miss Elizabeth and gorgeous George both complained. No day off, no, meaning he's out of balance. He's working hard, hard, hard. And you'll hear this at times from people who are very accomplished at what they do. Uh, Daryl Hall, I heard him say it. You know, you could say, well, there's 50 great songwriters here, 50 great singers, 50 great guitar players or, you know, arrangers or whatever. Why has this guy got 30 songs that the whole world know and this guy's got two? This one works harder. That's what Daryl is saying, mm. meaning, and it's his nature right. to work hard. He learned it from his parents. The same macho man learned it from his parents. Go and break your ass, work hard. This is life. This is what we're telling you to do, and he did it. Um, you're saying, where do these things come from? I'm saying back to you, um, in my shop. Pull it back a little farther. There you go, right there. I'm in my shop. I get a telephone call. Hi, this is such and such advertising agency in Connecticut, Stanford, Connecticut. You know, no one calls me like this. What do you, <laughs> who? <laughs> We're going to have Macho Man push our product Slim Jim. Like, I know what a Slim Jim is. I'm a vegetarian since 1970. Are you saw, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I saw Slim Jim in the store, but I don't know what it is. I don't know that it's dried meat. It's or, a fine piece of meat. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. So they say, well, this is Slim Jim. We want you to make clothes for Randy for Slim Jim commercials and this and that. And I say, okay. And they say there's 12 of us or nine of us sitting around this table we can all hear you, and I say, okay. I said, tell me the, what, what colors you want it to be and what do you want it to be? They're drawing a blank. I said, okay, let me start talking. How about we do three outfits in the, using the three colors that are in your product, black, red, and yellow. Okay, we got that. So they'll be predominantly black, and, you know, this one's more yellow, this one's more black, well, this one's more red. They'll all go with each other. Okay. I said, the next thing I need, I said, I need only one person to call me on the telephone and communicate with me. I'm not talking to a group of people right. later. Just give me one person to talk to. <clears throat> I said, and ten, send me 10 grand or five grand. I don't know what I said to get started. Um, and 
now again I got a free ride to make Macho Man Crazy, but with these colors to be used in a commercial for Slim Jim. What you try to say is, how the hell did you come up with this? Or how did you come up with this? You know, I just have some idea at some part in my head. Who knows? Let's try this. You know, we'll change the lettering or we'll do this this way or I'll start raggeding the... But you weren't worried about, like, what if this idea isn't good enough? Because he, you just were constantly making him new things. This is a great point you're bringing up. The point is, is that... Like, what if he doesn't want to pay for this outfit? Like, you were never worried about that. You had, you had an infinite... This is paid for. This is... <laughs> yeah. Forget that. Yeah. So, now we're talking about freedom to be creative. And the freedom is that you're making clothes for the macho man... The, the work is how many outfits can you come up with in a year that are cool? Not, <clears throat> might, and he, he never told me he didn't like something in his life, ever, ever. Didn't even hint at it like, it. this is not up to the, you know, and he would put on outfits. We had a mirror leaning up against the wall. He'd put on the outfits. There's a, a, a junk chair, comfortable foam next to the mirror. Elizabeth would sit in it. He'd come out of the dressing area, come over, look at himself in the mirror. He says, oh, I'm going to wear this to WrestleMania. You know. Now he'd go, now we're on the third outfit. He says, wow, this is cool. I'm going to wear this to WrestleMania. <laughs> you know, Le Elizabeth would just roll her eyes. I'd roll my eyes. You know, there's nothing you could say. <laughs> right. what he, it's his way of just saying he thinks it's cool. Yeah. But what I'm saying back to you is that from the beginning, I said to you, he has no visual sense whatsoever. So he's wearing the wrong pants, wrong shirt, wrong jacket, wrong glasses, wrong hat. You're going, dude, what the hell's, what are you doing? Oh, uh, he's not you know. pairing the shit up properly. Exactly. And I'm saying to her, <clears throat> or gorgeous George, only put in his thing the stuff that matches. You mm. know, don't, you can't do this with him because he doesn't know he's not thinking he's making a mistake he's just thinking oh this is mike's crazy clothes let's put them on and go you know and then he'll throw the glasses into the audience he'll throw the glasses on the ground i made an outfit once they were wrestling in downtown st pete on right by the water and he went they threw him in the water brand new clothes i just made with boots cowboy boots all hand painted salt water I'm a sailor, baby. You're ruining my clothes. And, and then I got to go, Mike, they're not your clothes. You made them. You sold them. They're somebody else's clothes. He can do whatever he wants with them. But all I'm saying to you is that where was my mind on this? My mind was let's go buy fabric that we can make a cool outfit for Macho Man. I start, I start to spend time with my wife, Susan, 1996, and I'm painting on his hat, on his shirt, on the back of his jacket, on the left and right leg of the pants, macho man, over and over again. I don't know what the word font is. I know there's all different kind of lettering, mm. and I didn't realize they're called fonts, mm -hmm. but okay, they're called fonts. I learned that. And... She says to me, listen, I'm going to lend you a computer for the Christmas vacation, 1996, and you can learn how to change the lettering around. You could stretch the lettering. That's all she told me. Right. You know, so she gives me the computer. You know, I learn how to do it, to stretch the lettering, and I start to make art on it, which I'm still doing to this day. I do outdoor shows, maybe a dozen shows in the state of Florida, and you can see the art on my website, michaelbraunart.com. Um, and that's B-R-A-U-N, his last name. So here we are. She gives me the computer. I learn how to stretch the lettering and do the whole deal with it. And, and I'm making the patterns. And I'm, then I'm hand painting Macho Man, Macho Man, mm -hmm. Macho Man, all these different ways. I don't know anything about a computer. If the computer, I think it breaks or something, 
I just put my hands up and I start yelling, it's broken, it's broken, fix right. the game. You know, I didn't know you had to marry tech support, <laughs> but you do. I'm just <laughs> warning anybody out there, you want good tech support, you got to marry it. But my point is, is that, again, I was just led to this. This woman gives me a computer that can do this, all this crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, is that it, how you made these? <laughs> Were these uh? Good, were they, I'll hold were, them up. Were oh. these helped out by the computer? Can I try them on? No, no. Yes, no? you can try them on. Okay. By all means. No, no. I'm, I'm just hand painting them. This is not a computer thing. So explain to me, did, was it his decision to paint the sunglasses, <laughs> or was this your your decision? Is it his decision, dude? What do you dude. Think? Ooh yeah. <laughs> Go. Put them feel on. Good. Try these. I feel. Try these. So this is what this is, is double face tape that I learned about double face tape from sales are put together with double face tape and then sewn. Mm -hmm. And this is holographic glitter. That's hand painted. That's just eyeball. That's, there's no computer to anything. That's just an eyeball. And this shot. was complimentary to an outfit that looked just like these. It, that went with it. Yeah. Okay. Madness. Okay. Yeah. And you'll see it on the net. This is, this is not rocket science here. Go ahead. These are really cool. I think <laughs> I've seen. I think I've seen him, uh, pictures of him wearing these. Oh yeah, yeah. There's no problem seeing through these. And you and, would think and it'd be so, hard to see through them because of all it, the paint. Exactly. Exactly. And your eye to your brain, your brain fills in what you can't see. Your eye just fills it in. It's just unbelievable because every everyone says, "Well, if those glasses, I couldn't walk across the street." And right. I'm saying, right. You know, you could write a letter in these glasses. Oh Easy. yeah, totally. Oh yeah, totally. Oh yeah. I could drive down. The, I could drive down I four wearing these things. That's exactly right. You could also wrestle. Anyway. So you're seeing now, if you're looking at God, the... God, these ones are sick. Sick, I beg your pardon. Sick as in good. S I understand. You didn't have to explain sick to me. So what... This is just... This is tape. Just tape, right? This is tape. Yep. So this is a film that I'm buying that has a backing. It's stuck to the backing. And... If you go to the store that makes the signs, they have a machine that cuts out the letters. Johnny's Burgers, okay? Now, it cuts it out, and there's a, a tape that they put on top of it where you can pull it off and put this lettering, Johnny's mm. Burgers, on the window and rub it down, then you got it. You know, so I'm using their technology. I figured out how to do it. Um, some of it I did in the computer, but a lot of it is just eyeballed. Um, but what I'm saying to you here is that I wanted to have the same print of this zebra-looking mush that's on his belt, this black jacket, black pants, this fringe, all kind of stuff with that exact pattern on it, meaning there's at least three different color combinations of outfits made for Slim Jim. And then this spare pieces, I, I got this idea for a hat or that idea, <clears throat> meaning they all go with each other. Some look better against this background or that background or fit this newness that they're doing or this idea that they're trying to, you know, come across. But... All I'm saying to you is that I'm just playing. I'm just, right. you know. Are you constantly trying to, is it is it difficult for you or are you thinking about trying to outdo yourself for the next one? Like, like this outfit was great. He loved it. The audience loved it. Now, are you worried or concerned about trying to up the level of outrage or how make the next okay, costume even more saying. outrageous or Here's flamboyant? The answer. Here's the answer. It's, it's in two parts, and the two parts are, A, 
you're making so many outfits, you don't have that much time to think. Mm. So think, worry, criticize yourself, whatever. You're going to buy fabric. You're cutting up the fabric. You're trying this with it, trying that with it. You're telling Vera, put it, do it this way, do it that way. You know, Vera sometimes, she doesn't get, I'm writing a note, do this, this, and this on this. She doesn't sometimes understand, Michael, what the hell he wanted. She does something else. Maybe it's cooler. Maybe it's cooler. Um, but in general, there's no time to do it. You're just trying to make cool clothes. Mm. Each week, each month, you're trying to use all the parts. So we're talking about holographic glitter on, you know, these right here or you're talking about <clears throat> here's these are painted then some of the stuff is painted and then the glitter's put on top of the paint um i don't know if any of it's here these are rhinestones that are glued on there um here's rhinestones that have been banged off you know mm -hmm. as rough as he is you know with the outfit so i'm just saying to you that there's no time for it there's just a time to to do what you're doing Go buy the fabric, chop right. it up, give it to Vera, talk with Tony, see what she's going to say about this or that. And if you're into romance, so I start to go out with Susan. It's 1996. She lends me the computer. Now I have her come over to the house Monday night to see the clothes that we made. She saw me making the clothes. She knows Macho Man because she's there when he's coming at certain times. She's teaching at a school right near where we are, um, a middle school. And she sees this game. Here's what's going on. You know, you, you can't really explain it, but... This is the, the romantic Monday night bra thing. You know, mm. you, you got to go over to Mike's house and, oh, man, I'm a Monday. And he delivered the clothes on Friday. And you were there when the clothes were delivered. Now we're going to see them on TV. And, oh, this is a thing. All I'm saying to you is you're just doing the best you can. Was that satisfying to watch Monday Night Raw and watch everyone wear your clothes or watch Macho Man wear your outfits? Was it kind you of know, like a sense of people, satisfaction? People often ask this, and I, I'm going to say, the answer has to be yes, but it's really not from this point of view. In the early days, I'm telling you that the Vanilla Fudge are on Ed Sullivan. I tell my mother, my proper Canadian, my mother, number two or three, depend on how you want to count. And I hmm. tell her, watch, watch this group, the Vanilla Fudge are on Ed Sullivan tomorrow night you know, with clothes that we made, you know, because they had sent me to military school in the eighth grade because they were th hoping for, you know, doctor or lawyer. Then they realized, hmm, I think we might get post office picture on this. I don't know mm. with this guy here, you know, meaning I'm not fitting in. And this is a very rich neighborhood. This is old time money, huge houses, huge boats. Huge Your parents were pretty wealthy? Yeah, they were wealthy, and but everyone around us was wealthy. Mm. So I was raised with these people, and I raced sailboats with them, so I got where that headspace was. And all I'm saying to you is that, so I tell her, watch the show. You know, it's the fudge, you know, doing, you keep me hanging on. And they got lace shirts on, proper women's lace you know, and I'm making a shirt for the drummer out of it, you know, because it's obviously not hot. Anyway, <clears throat> long story short, I call my mother the next day. I said, Mom, did you watch the show? She says, yeah, meaning they're living in New York, and obviously I'm in Florida. She says, yeah. I said, what would you think? She said, well, we like the clothes, but they're goons. She tells me they're goons. I said, Mom. They're from Far Rockaway. This is just an act. This is show business. She couldn't get it. She could not get it, meaning she's believing what she's seeing. Right. I said, this is an act. This is an act. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, people and, back then didn't understand that, that it, was all, it was all set up. It was played. And didn't, and didn't like 
the modern music at all, not even a little bit. This is like some horrific thing. I, I couldn't even tell you. From 50s music, 60s music, early rock and roll, mm -hmm. Chuck Berry, whatever. Were your parents, when you were young, were they supportive of your creative endeavors? Were they telling you just to do whatever you want, do what makes you happy? No, no, they're they selling me to military school. Then they see my sister gets me out of that. That's three years of that. Then the last two years of high school, I'm in a very proper boys prep school in Connecticut, you know. And, you know, one of the teachers that I had it was a real bright guy, English teacher. He said, you should get a job as a barber. He knew I cut hair, meaning I see someone cut hair, and I see that I could cut hair. I, you just see, let me see you do it once. I can, I know I could do it, you know. So I'm cutting hair to make money, you know, spare money. He says, you should get a job. You should have a trade is what he's saying to me, meaning you're a moron, dude. You know, <laughs> get a trade and, and go do that. Um, and he's not saying it in an insulting way. You could take it in an insulting way, but... Once I sort of found my way is that I had an ability to make something that was artistic and or cool for stages, you know, end of story. There's nothing you could say, you know, did I kill myself to learn how to do it, to how to make patterns, <clears throat> to all the exotic sewing machines, buying sewing machines, buying fabric, you know, there's an art to that. Um, I mean, and so... I worked hard at it, but it just doesn't fit into the normal, you know, <laughs> you know, he grew up and he became a lawyer and he defended whatever kind of people, you know, speeding tickets or, you know, whatever it is, mm. you know, it just, it's Hamilton beyond me. Ah, my father sees that he can't do much with this kid. And even my sister before me, the same thing, um, in a different way, but the same, same deal. Um, my father arranges for his son that he can't get to do well in school or listen to him. He sends him to the Midwest, to Wisconsin, to be in a training program. He, he invents this, a training program in Hamilton Beach because he's making stuff for them. He knows the guy that's the president of it. So he says to the guy, listen, you know, my, have my son be around there for a few months and then we'll send him to your uh, advertising agency, let him stay there for a month and let him go with the PR people for a month, you know, that are taking care of the chef that just left the white house or whatever so he knows what the, what is the game to to be to be making electric carving knives how does a big business work how does an advertising company work mm. how does a pr company work how you know how does this go so the guy does it because he's no way he can get out of it you know you got mike he's a pain in the ass but he doesn't talk much thank god so you know we'll put up with him and so I learned, okay, this is what the advertising business is about. This is what PR is about. This is what manufacturing is about. I'm going to all the business meetings with the boys that are supposed to know what they're doing and all that stuff. All I'm saying to you is it just let me know I don't like this at all. Mm. The military school told me, you don't want to be involved. This is not a fun thing, Mike. Later. You got to look under a lot of skirts. People, A lot of Ooh. people have said it that way. You got Ooh. to see. A lot of people don't understand what it's like to be in those different worlds. And I was backstage as a child at maybe six years old, um, maybe seven. My mother, who preferred dogs to humans... And my parent, my father would bring home people to do business in this big fancy house and the proper people and all that stuff. And my mother, in the first fifteen minutes, 
she would say, I prefer dogs to humans. <laughs> you know, I mean, she just dropped the bomb like, I'm not into you. Great icebreaker. <laughs> exactly. Great icebreaker. And she had in my house, my whole childhood, between six and ten dogs in pairs, show dogs. So from tiny dogs to big dogs, but in pairs. Um, and I'd, so I'd be around all these dogs all the times, and, and I'm just telling you, she's into show dogs. End of story. So the guy that's showing her dogs, the handler is what they're called, mm. He works at Radio City Music Hall. He is the uh, stage manager for Radio City Music Hall. So my mother gets me in there. She says, okay, go backstage, go with him. And, you know, now we're standing, and the Rockettes, the girls that kick their legs up in the air, the beautiful girls, so they're there hooking up, and then, you know, one gets on to the next one. They're holding each other's shoulders, and they're kicking their legs up, and, there's maybe 30 of them or I don't know. There's a lot of girls. Now, maybe I'm seven, eight years old. I'm going, I never saw anything like this before. I was never backstage before. There's something sort of cool about whatever these beings are <laughs> that are kicking their legs in the air. I'm going, something cool with this. What's happening here? Why does this make me feel funny? Yeah, this is good. What is this? Um, and... I also went some connection to my to my birth mother's family had something to do with TV in Miami and they were doing the Howdy Doody show. I went I'm a little teeny kid. I went there. I sat in the peanut gallery. So I'm seeing what this is. So this is meaning I'm backstage and then I'm in the front of the stage. I'm seeing what's going on. So this is like just a part of life to me. It's, mm. This is no big deal. For me to go to talk to Carmine, you know, he's playing in, you know, some military kind of place. You know, I thought nothing of it. And so I was used to being able to communicate with these people. We make clothes. This is how we do it. Here's, you could choose this, you could choose that, whatever. Um, Randy, you know, you say, well, are you concerned about did he like it or he didn't like it? He got over in it is what it was. And it helped him to compete in his head against the people that were bigger than him, meaning he was making a bigger, stronger statement than they were. Visually, right. with his personality, how he talked, how he acted, how he wrestled. But in this documentary they just did on him, he had some very big match in WrestleMania three, and whoever he was wrestling with, Randy tortured this guy. Two, they had a pad of paper, like a legal size pad. Every line is the move, and they're rehearsing in these moves. This is three pages of run here, do that, flip me over here, flip me out there, you know, slap my face, step on my foot, flip me in. And guy says, how hard Randy worked on this. He's working for Randy, meaning he's just trying for this to be great. And they say it, this is his best match ever. All I'm saying to you is that this is hard work. And I see him at times tear shirts that I've made for him, throw the glasses away, you know, do all kind of crazy stuff. It's, this is him. I'm making clothes for that person to do what they want, but it's the same with Jimmy. Jimmy gets what I'm doing for him. It's working for him. He likes it. It's good that he can contact this fool in Tampa and say, I need more of this or more of that, or you got something for me. I got Madison Square Garden in two weeks. Can you come, you know, would you come, you and Tony, can you come? So Tony and I and Elena go to Madison Square Garden. You think he's calling me up to invite, because he wants Tony and Michael and Elena to come. 
He just wants new clothes, what he wants. He'll take Michael and Tony. Yes, we'll sit in the front row. Yes, we have a tape of him dedicating a song to us, you know, where it says this is dedicated to Michael and Tony and Elena, you know. But all I'm saying to you is that if you take all the emotion out of it, this is just business. This is just Mm. he's making a product that's working for these people, you can say he's working hard. You can say he's talented. You could say he's not talented. You could say anything you want about it. Just It's just business. Um, and I was taught that because that was one of the lessons in life for me to learn. Like, you know, everyone freaks out and they say, you know, when we started to do the outdoor art shows, Susan writes a bio, born here, went to school there, made clothes for, and then it's, you know, 50 names or whatever, big name drop. Did you ever meet Cher? Did you meet Jimi Hendrix? I said, oh, no, no, we did it through the internet. You know, <laughs> they didn't have an internet then. Um, they couldn't believe that we ever met him, mm-hmm. you know, and then I said, yeah, Macho Man, what was he like? You know, all I'm saying to you is that people put these entertainers on some pedestal right some special place these are humans Mm. you know and they're not treated like humans the more the the fame is the less anyone could be one-on-one with them back to you know women are having sex with me just to say they had sex with Jimi hendrix you know you never thought of this in your life i never thought of it in my life but once it goes down i'm going you mean these 13 girls that are lined up here, they just want to have sex with me because they heard I made clothes for Jimmy? This is why? Well, I'll try a few. I'll try a few. You, know, you understand the silliness of it. But it's a sad part of humanity that I was forced to see, meaning I'm just a human like everybody else, you know, and I got my favorite actor or actresses or singer or whatever, you know, that if you... You know, I got to go make clothes for whoever the thing is. I'm, I mean, I, why, why did that make him sad, though? Why, why would that make you sad? Just because, okay, it, is because that's, isn't, that, isn't that just the, the nature of humans or the nature of, yes, of sexual yes. beings? They, they attract to the, the dominant alpha, the, the number one, the person who's going to protect yes. them, the okay. person who can. Okay, the answer is yes to what you're saying, but... He was hoping they'd like him for who he was, just Jimmy. Not because he sold 10 billion records or not because he was the best guitar player in the world. You know, none of that. Or that he wrote phenomenal, phenomenal songs. Mm. He wanted them to like just Jimmy. Hmm. I mean, and... I'm just I'm not saying this doesn't go on that this is in a not a need based situation that it is. It <laughs> is a need based situation. But he was hoping for a higher need, meaning you really were you loved his personality, you loved his humor, you loved his way of being, you loved his love, you know, whatever. But not just cuz his name is Jimmy and maybe he wanted a deeper connection, exactly. maybe. He okay, wanted, deeper says it in a simple way. He wanted you know, did he ever have a long-term girlfriend or anything like that? I don't know. An assortment. Yeah. An assortment. Never someone that he could settle down with and have children with, and maybe that's what he was looking no, for. And he found something may- much more shallower with all these young teeny boppers bouncing through his hotel room every night. Exactly. 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 Hmm. I I wish I could empathize with <laughs> with his problem, but I I can't imagine putting myself in his shoes. So, I don't know. But if their 15 were lined up each day, after a year or two, you got to select one or two yeah. or three, you know. Yeah. You got to, you know, and they're, they're here because they hear you're a billionaire. You're a billionaire. He's just, he's a rich guy. Oh, we, we'll have a, we'll take some time with him. Or he's rich and he does this or that, whatever the thing is. Mm. You know, after a while you'd go, <laughs> Uh, well, I like the sex, but uh, I if need you're in more that line, connection. just because I'm a billionaire, you're almost disqualifying yourself. You know what I mean? For something serious. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. 
So what did you train? How did you transition into doing what you're doing now? Susan lent me a computer, as I said, in 1996, so I could change the fonts around and stretch the fonts and make the patterns and all that stuff for lettering that I was doing by eye and by hand. And in the process, I bought a program called Painter got 400 virtual brushes in the computer, and I started to paint. Now a year goes by, I show it to you, I say, what do you think? You know, we're old friends, you're supposed to tell me you like it, you know. You look me in the eye, you say, yo, Mike, keep your day job. Meaning it wasn't bad, but it was nothing to die over. And then in time, it just evolved into... I'll show you five pieces. We'll take a break, and I'll show you five pieces. Uh, is it on your website? Yeah, yeah. What, uh, what's your website called? Michael Braun? MichaelBraunArt.com, one word. Aiden, pull it up. Aiden, pull it up, <laughs> dude, man. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, jumping from doing what you're doing, creating these extraordinary outfits, outfit designs for people into... Like, did you just one day just quit or did it? No, 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 no. I'm playing with the computer and after a year it starts to get cool. And people are going, wow, I want that. You know, can you make me one of those? Mm. <clears throat> um, we get into art gallery. Susan gets me into an art gallery. You know, people, they're selling the art. Then she says, we need to do outdoor art shows. Mm -hmm. And I give her the old man. Oh, this sounds like a schlep. And I, oh, yeah, <laughs> schlep. Yeah, schlep. What are you talking about this? And, but she. I don't want to deal with all these schlemiels. Schlemiels. <laughs> so she gets me into the outdoor art show, which is correct. Meaning you're oh, getting wow. to see the people respond to the artwork. They don't care about you. They just care about, is this something I want to give this guy money for? They don't care if you, they don't like my flip-flops or my jeans or whatever. They just care if it's going to look good in their living room. Exactly. Exactly right. And so we're making art, and it's selling. Um, but to me, it's the same thing. It's just a creative process. And the beauty of making art in a computer is that there's no... <laughs> First of all, there's no one saying I got Madison Square Garden in two weeks and I got to have some great outfit or I got WrestleMania in 10 right. days or whatever. So that pressure is gone. Or don't spend, you know, it can't be more than $1,000 or $2,000, whatever the thing is. The other thing is this, is that as I'm painting. Yeah, that's interesting. The biggest difference is your, your clothing work was all commissioned. And this is the opposite of that. This is the opposite of that. Not to say that some of this is commissioned, that they say, I want that piece, but I need it six feet tall, and it's got to be red. Mm. People say that to me, and I'll do it. I'm not saying it always works. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. But my point to you <clears throat> is that I'm free to make the art. Back to Jimmy. You know, whatever takes you there. You know, don't be hesitant to take and make something anything to your fancy as long as it's specially made as art here i'm saving the file at 50 percent 70 percent 90 percent you know and there's what i call the stephen stills effect meaning the day you make the thing stephen stills wrote this song love the one you're with you think it's wonderful you know a week later you're going wow how come see that it was too blue or the lower right corner is just not doing it i don't know why but it's not so with the computer i can then change this into let's fix the lower right corner or let's make this blue thing that the person wants in red let's do that so the freedom of trying this or trying that or changing the proportions this was fairly square now we got a long thin horizontal piece or a long thin vertical piece I mean, it's just wild. And the people you get to see what's going on in an art show, they don't care about Mike at all. They just walk and they look, they look, they look at the back of the tent, the sides, inside this and that. 
They'll look and they'll look and they just say, I want that one. They don't care. Where did you go to school? What was your idea? What was your inspiration? How the hell did you ever get to this? They just go, wow, I want that. Hmm. That's all. End of story. You don't have to talk, Mike. You can shut up. We don't want to listen to your crap anymore. And how does that make you feel? Oh, it's fine. It's great. You're it's not connect. You're not. You don't have any sort of emotional connection to, attachment to your art, to the stuff that to you. To all of it, all of it, none the clothes, of it. Because <clears throat> I did it so many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. You say, well, now you see this thing on an album cover. You mm. see this thing on television. You see this thing on the Macho Man documentary. You see this art piece that these people wanted at 90 inches wide. You know, I tell them, well, just go put your tape on the wall and tell me how wide you want it. The guy emails me back, 96 by, you know, 30 or something. You just, some huge thing, you know. You know, meaning he's not thinking it's huge. He's thinking, I put the tape on my wall. That's what Mike told me to do. I saw the sample of what he was talking about. He emailed it to me. I saw his work. I just loved it. I want this piece. He made it a little green or he just stretched it for me. And now it's this size. It's fine. What I'm saying to you is that there's a percentage of people in an art show or selling clothes or wrestlers that love it. Some people got no idea even what you're doing. Some people says, what is that crap? You know, and they're entitled to it. It's all, it's just part of life. And right. so I'm just making clothes. S you know, some of them sell. I'm just making art. Some of it sells. Some they're looking at me like, what the hell are you thinking, Mike? You know, meaning I do things mostly where it's a series. I might have five of these. I might have 20 of these. You know, I'm trying this. I'm trying that. Let's make it green or blue or let's change the format of it. Let's do this. Let's do that. As I'm doing it, I'm not thinking, of, I'm thinking, well, maybe this will be better. Sometimes I got to be away from it a day or week, a month mm. or whatever. Or I spent all this time, I spent two months on this series and did it all different kind of ways and colors and shapes and formats and whatever. You know, I like it, Susan. She says, yeah, it's all right. Nobody else. It's nobody. Or... Some guy that w worked for Rush Limbaugh, he and I liked it, and that was the, in the world. There's two people. <laughs> you know, it's a funny deal. So, uh -huh. But that's just part of the game. So back to your thing about making the clothes. You're just making them all the time, and you've been beaten into the fact that some of these clothes they'll think is wonderful. Some they, they're not going to like. Some they're going to tear. They're going to rip. They're going to go into the salt water in. You know, somebody's going to throw the glasses. You know, it's just part of the game. It's, you know, it's different than what you think it's going to be if you don't know anything about it. But if Mike, as soon as Mike tells you that here's the game, here's how it goes, mm -hmm. you're going you're gonna to paint 10 pictures. You know, three are going to sell and seven, they're going to just walk by like they're looking to go with the baby in the stroller or they're looking to buy jewelry or they're looking to buy you know, plants for their backyard, you know, you don't know what's happening yeah. here. You know, you're just doing the best you can with the parts in front of you, but it's not personal. They don't care about you. If someone came to you and wanted some sort of special suit, some crazy design suit, would you do it for them? I'm not sewing anymore. I not sewing in, anymore? No, I stopped in 2001, thank okay. God. So no more. No you more. put that behind you. That chapter of your life is closed. Um, I did it. I would say I did it, and I'm very glad to do art on a computer. It's a very clean thing to do. I'm not involved with any people. I can change the thing, you know, if it's not so good. I, I enjoy it. Um, and the other thing I'd say that's sort of strange is there's that— something, There's something, like, really unique, and there's something about— a piece of art you can buy that you can wear wherever you go. There's something about that that's different. For sure. And and people got exactly what you're talking about, meaning they're not educated in this at all, and they were very happy to get one-of-a-kind pieces. 
Um, Because I'm, they're asking for it to be a certain way. I'm making pants, Mm. jeans with buttons down the side and button fly and, you know, denim lined and top stitched and lacing and this and that. You know, they're glad to get it. And they're talking about it to this day. They bought this in the 70s and the 80s and Mm -hmm. the 90s. They're still talking about it. I got this outfit from, I still have it. You know, we got over big time with it, you know. Anyway. Mindy Abel. Mindy Abel. Oh. Uh, Mindy? There's a, there's a, there was a, a couple named Lance Abair and his wife lived in St. Peter's, a sax player in a band, keyboard player, songwriter, um, had a daughter, had a baby whatever in the 70s mm-hmm. and she became a sax player that's known Mindy Abair A B A I R I think I'm spelling it right anyway she calls me on the phone she says listen I live in LA I mean and I obviously remember her and um, I know the parents for a thousand years I live in LA I live in LA the guy that makes my clothes I showed him a pair of pants that you made from my father in the 70s. He, and I needed him to be altered to fit me. He told me he wouldn't touch him. This is, he never saw anything like this in his life. It's the mechanics of it, the whole thing. He this is in another place. So I said, when you come to Florida, come, I'll do them. So I, I, we took the pants apart, put them back together where they would fit her and all that. Um, and she wore them on American Idol and all that and took all kind of pictures in them. But all I'm saying to you is that, do I know how to sew? Yes. Um, Am I glad to do a job like that for her, for no money? Yeah, of course. But my point is, is that this whole emotional thing about seeing it on television or an album cover, it's not there. It may just be me. It may just be me. I don't know what to tell you. It may be how I needed to see this whole thing in order to get through it. If I was spending time, you know, that this Jimi Hendrix outfit, I didn't like the way it looked, or Jimmy ripped it, or the audience didn't like it, or they didn't use it for the album cover, or, you know, whatever. It's a different place I would be, and maybe, a, you know. I mean, it's it's also the most tremendous incredible marketing you could have had for yourself it's it's the, you potentially would not have been as successful if you were if Jimi hendrix wasn't a international superstar rock and roll musician you know what i mean like my story is i say well if you're making clothes for god in those days you know you're just saying well i'm making god's clothes you know and so you know that's you know, no one can say anything you know they say you're into name dropping you know, and right. you understand what name dropping is. And, you know, some Nashville musician, I can't think of who it is, he says, yeah, Paul McCartney told me I shouldn't name drop, you know, or some kind of thing like that. He was making the joke, meaning this is a big deal, but you're saying you made clothes for Jimi Hendrix or this guy that I'm taking you to made clothes for Jimi Hendrix. But on the another side of that thing is that, Everybody with eyes saw that we were making clothes that was around Tampa. They saw it. So the pimps started to come. In the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, they started to come. We're making clothes for them. In this area? (laughs) In this area, the pimps. So we're making clothes for them. Well, I don't know about pimps. I, I never met a pimp before this, but I got an education and it was beautiful. Meaning... These are guys doing what my grandmother was doing. She's trying to survive. Mm. They're trying to survive. So the story was, I'm making clothes for a guy named Joe. I call him Pimp Joe. (laughs) We make him lots of clothes, and it's all good. When Joe brings someone to the shop, another pimp, He says, as he introduces that person to Michael, he says, he's all right. 
What he's saying is he's all right with what we're doing. He's all right with our skin color. He's all right with whatever. He's not making any judgment. He's making clothes is what he's doing. You want clothes? He's your guy. But he's not unhappy about your shoe size. He doesn't care what kind of shoes you have. He doesn't care what kind of haircut you have. He just makes clothes. Mm. End of story. And in the process, Joe tells me he picked cotton in Georgia. I, I think it's Georgia. It could be Carolina. But he picked cotton. And when he was 19, he went to New Orleans. A prostitute saw him and says, come on, I'm going to teach you how to be a pimp. You're going to be my pimp. What? Exactly what? Exactly what? Meaning she knew the game. She knew this guy looked the part and could act the part. It taught him how to be a pimp. They call, he comes with the Cadillac, El Dorado, and all that stuff. Anyway, so we're making close for him. We're friends. We're, we're laughing. We're having fun. Now, I don't see Joe for a few years. I don't think anything of it because they move around. You know, they go up north. They do this, that, whatever. I don't see Joe. Now, a car pulls up to our shop behind our house on Bayshore Boulevard, South, Saint, South Tampa. Two guys get out with suits. I'm just telling you, nobody ever came into that shop with a suit on. What are you talking? Dude, you know, what are you doing with a suit? Mm. It's just there's no reason. It's not that it's yeah. against the law. There's just not a reason. Right. You know, these are music people. These are wrestlers. Suits, no. So they come in. He said, hi, we're with the FBI. I said, oh, let me see the thing. Let me see the, the sticker and the, the, the badge and all that. I never saw this. Meaning, here's Mike. Mike's not doing anything to break the law. Not because he agrees with the law or disagrees with the law or anything or that he wants to break the law. He just into peace of mind. He doesn't want to be worried. They're going to come and arrest me because I was speeding over here or they think mm. I robbed a bank or they th you think I'm this or that. It make no difference. I don't care. I did nothing. You know, you're going to, you want to listen to all my phone conversations and see all of whatever wrote on the computer. You'll die of boredom. End of story. <laughs> you know, that's, I'm warning you. So, so they come in. I get them to show me the badge. I say, oh, this was so cool. I wish I had pictures, but I don't. So they show me the and They say, do you know Joe Lee Sanders? I said, no. They take out the mug book, big fat mug book, and they open it and go and go. And, you know, we're on page 20 or whatever. I said, oh, yeah, it's Joe, Pimp Joe. I know him. When did you see him last? I said, I don't know. I'm really bad on time, but maybe a year and a half, maybe two years. I don't know. Why? He was stealing mail. He went to jail for stealing men. They're looking for him again for something. I don't know, for the same thing. I don't even know what. They leave. Now another year goes back by, maybe two. I mean, again, I got no idea on time. Now Joe comes. I said, Joe, what's happening? The FBI came here and all that. It was great. I, I mean, I got to see the badge and everything. And he says, he said it was a white boy crime. They taught me, white boys taught me how to do steal mail on the beginning of the month for some <clears throat> kind of thing. You know, people get checks in the mail mm. and that you, you just sign them and you cash them and whatever. I mean, I have no idea what I'm talking about, but I mean, that's what he said. Something like you get mm -hmm. some kind of checks at the end of the month or the beginning of the month. And he goes to jail for this thing. Um, but all I'm saying to you is that this is just a regular guy trying to survive, meaning that's why he's doing this. Right. I'm not saying anything about legal, illegal. And what it taught me was he's no different than Jimmy. He's no different than Macho Man. Everyone's doing whatever they do as best as they can, whatever their destiny is, however the thing works out. Mm. And it's nothing to criticize him about and it's nothing to say it's wonderful about it's nothing it's just this is joe this is jimmy this is macho man this is miss elizabeth this is these are just people
Mm. To you, they're all people. To you, they're all people that walked in your shop that you yeah. wanted to create. Yeah. They wanted yeah. you to create something for yeah. them. Yeah, I mean, and above my shop, uh, where we made the clothes, is an apartment. So we, it's rented to a couple that we know. The lady is a singer. The man is connect, is her manager and is connected with all the R&B groups he knows about this. He brings two guys with him, and he just shows them, this is what Mike is doing, meaning these people aren't interested in these kind of clothes. But he brings them in the shop, and the radio's on. And whatever's on the radio, they can sing harmony with, whatever, I don't care what it is, they can sing harmony with it this fast. As it's going by, they can sing. Who is it? It's two of the pips, Gladys Knight and the pips, Rainy day, rainy night in Georgia. Oh, wow. This is them exactly. Oh wow! Meaning, I'm going. Wow, these guys can really sing. This is a wild thing. That they, I mean, and I know nothing about it. I'm not mm. a musician. I don't know about that part of it, but I know that these guys were there in the happy place with singing background music, and these were the pips. You know, meaning wow. uh, exactly. That's wild. Exactly. Um, but I think. The other thing about you saying about all the clothes for Jimmy or Macho Man is that I see him so much on the internet and on movies and things and album covers that it's just it's just a part of life. It's mm. just you know, it's something that you did exactly. It's something that exactly. Uh, exactly. I think I find it so interesting that how you were able just to treat it like a job, just to treat it as. I didn't, almost didn't have time for, and that was the destiny to show me that these are standard issue human beings, everyone, right. everyone. Mm -hmm. Don't judge anybody. Be kind to all of them. Be a human being. You know, this is, you know, that's why Joe is saying he's all right. Mm. You know, he's right. saying that we're, I mean, nothing. Um, Jimmy knows that I'm concerned about the clothes I'm working here. I'm trying to make some cool clothes for him. That's what he wants. Not because he's Jimi Hendrix, because this is what I do, and this is who he is, meaning I, I told a story in in this documentary that went by recently on A&E, documentary on Macho Man Randy Savage, but that as I'm making the clothes for Macho Man, in that shop... Is glasses being made? I mean, I got pictures of maybe 15 or 20 pair of glasses on a board being made at the same time where I'm painting the edges of the glasses or I'm putting the, the glitter on them or I'm painting mm. this. But there's all these, they're lined up in rows and rows. I'm painting lots of glasses. Um, but my point is, is that in doing this, I'm seeing that the business of trying to do it as well as I can is made worse by the distraction of, well, this is going to be on television. This is macho man. This is, this is just another guy, meaning I'm just trying to do the best that I can with the parts, again, that are in front of me. And What do you mean it's made worse? It's distracted. I'm my creative... Or my work ethic is distracted uh, by by the attention, by the loss of breath because of who this person is. Oh, okay. There's lots of way to say it. Okay, but I see what you're saying. I'm just they're expecting something. I'm expecting something. Tony is expecting me to make clothes. That's what I do. End of story. There's no mm -hmm. more to it. There's mm -hmm. no romance to it it's, it's business mm -hmm. you know and so then i could see oh i gotta f go fix that buttonhole machine it's, these buttonholes aren't right. <laughs> right or i need you know a thousand pearl buttons where am i going to get them from i gotta fly to new york and then go <clears> to new jersey and find someone that's making you know one inch pearl buttons and i'll buy seconds and shift mm -hmm. through and not use the bad ones or whatever um so there's just so much of time that is eaten up with the actual work of the thing that you get away from 
the side ideas of well, this person's famous on account of or this person went to jail for whatever or you know meaning these are all just humans i learned this as a little kid so i got this kind of mother i lost that one and i got this kind of mother i lost that one i got arlene arlene's a brooklyn dodger fan oh man mm-hmm. i mean and now the game is on television television was just starting then now arlene's vacuuming for hours, the foyer where the television is, <laughs> so she can watch it because she's a devoted fan. You understand what I'm yeah. saying? But I'm saying to you that I I lo- love this one. I love that one. I mean, I'm on my fifth mother. Do I love them all? Yeah. And do I listen to them? Yes. You know, I'm telling you, this mother that I have now that's younger than me, she tells me to do this or that. You know, or buys me echinacea tea that I got to, you know, I got to take it. It's just insanity. It's just ridiculous. Um, And and the poetry thing that I talked about, you know, where I'm thinking, well, well, I'm not into poetry. What are you talking about? Then I realize what Jimmy's doing is poetry and that he's doing it in a phenomenal way or Dylan's doing it in a phenomenal way. Um... It's just. Did you ever save any of the letters he wrote you? Oh, I, I'll email it to you. You could put it on with this. You still have them? I have a letter. I'm going to send it to you. Oh, okay. Oh, he's going to put it up. Oh, he's going to put it up. Are they on your website? I, maybe it is. What she's doing, she's gotten up. She knows the game. That's Believe incredible, me, she knows man. The game. So this is written on telephone memo pad. So it's a pink pad. And it says on the top, and this is obviously from the very old days, it says, so-and-so called at such-and-such date on such and a time. Here's the subject. They want you to call them back with this information, and they're available at this time or that time, whatever. And the other side of it is just blank. So that's where he's writing, dear couple, do this, do that, more shirts with odd sleeves, double-stitch oh. the pants. Okay, she's working on it. Uh, she's working on it. So all I'm saying to you is that. Um, oh, there you go. It's lower right hand corner. Is it? But okay. Maybe you can punch in on it, zoom in on it, Aiden. I'll send it to you. I'll okay. Send it to yeah, you. yeah, yeah. Send it to me. That's really cool. Now you did stuff for Bob Dylan. We did. You know, we met Bob Dylan at what's called Curtis Hickson Hall. Mm-hmm. Now it's just a park. They took down the building. Um. We had a girl that that was around in the day calls me and says, listen, I'm at the Clearwater, whatever it is, I don't even know, some hotel uh, on a huge piece of property, very old building, wood building. Um, I'm with Bob Dylan, you know, uh, come show him clothes, whatever. The Jack Tar Hotel, the Scientology building? No, 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 no. This is wood. It's it's on a big piece of property. It's the oldest. It's the largest or oldest wooden structure anywhere in this part of the world, or hmm. some kind of thing. You'll find it. You'll find it. No yeah. big deal. Um, <clears throat> and so we go there, and he's just finished painting a four. This is my guess. Four by eight sheet of plywood. He painted it. It's a painting. He's laying on the floor, laying on his back in the sun, looking at the thing. Very quiet. He now starts to, the band is rehearsing in this huge dance hall kind of place, but big, wood. And there's nobody in the audience, just myself, the guy that was with me, I think Randy Edwards was with me. Um, and one of the guitar players for the Rolling Stones who died soon after that, I forgot his name. Um, I I can't think of his name. Anyway, he, he, we're standing there, they're, they're playing, they're, they're practicing. Bob is outside, now I'm outside, uh, and there's a porch, or not a porch, but the thing that goes around the edge of a building, you know, an eight foot wide, whatever it's called. Um. Bob is sitting on the floor of this, leaning up against the building, 
and he's whittling. He's got a knife and a piece of wood. He's whittling. And I'm going, what the hell is going on here? And nobody talks to him except they walk over, they lean over from the waist, they say whatever they got to say, and then they walk away. No one, he's not talking to anybody. He's just, I'm just telling you what's going on. Now he goes over to the stage and he starts to play with them. They got a very young violin player girl that's supposed to be phenomenal. And they, they're playing. And he says, stop. And he says, this, you don't know this part or this goes like this. And they try it again. He says, okay, let, forget that one. Blow it off. Meaning they're not doing that song because she's not playing it right, whatever. I mean, and they're just playing off the top of their heads. There's mm -hmm. no sheet music or right. anything like that. Now, he, I show him a denim coat, like to your knees. This is used denim from Goodwill, carefully cut up, ironed, padded shoulders, lined in velvet coat with ribbons on it. And we did a lot of ribbon clothes in those days. Um, he sees it, thinks it's cool. And I forget exactly how the thing goes. He takes it. And I think then it gets given back to me mm. later on. He, do he doesn't have it. And I think he just buys some scarves and stuff. Mm -hmm. But this is a quiet person. Our experience with him at that time, I mean, and there's maybe 50 people in all those bands that are playing with him. Um, the Rolling Thunder Review was the name of it. Mm. <coughs> so, I'm with a girl that worked with us, Dawn Jordan, and she's so blown away by, this is Bob Dylan, she couldn't even stand next to me. She had to walk back. As he walked to me and we're talking, he, she, she, she couldn't handle it. This is more than she could deal with. This is, wow. this is Bob Dylan. Again, this is like God to her or some kind yeah. of, you know, whatever. This is crazy. Um, so all I'm saying to you is that the expectation of that person is let's do business. you got some clothes. you got some art. you got some whatever right. the thing is. Right. Let's do that. You know, I don't need to come around you to you tell me I'm the most wonderful guitar player, songwriter, art maker, whatever that there is in the world or, mm. you know, whatever. You're just doing business. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for your time, Michael. This has been extraordinary. Just some of your stories are fascinating. Where, sorry, what were you going to say? You, first of all, you're most welcome. Second of all, if any of your boys and girls listening got any questions, they could email them to you, and I'll try to answer them for you. Yeah. How can people listening and or watching this find you and get a hold or get a hold of you? And so there's see a website. There's a website that is called michaelbraunart.com, and it's got the art on it. It's got, um, I think Jimmy's letter is on it, but maybe mm. Susan tried to bring it up and it's not on it. Mm. But there's all kind of things like that. But you could just, my email address is on there. You got a question or you got a thing or whatever you want to know about, you know, this piece of art. Can I get it in green? Can I get it bigger or, you know, whatever. Oh, there's your um, business card and your, with your phone number on it and everything. Yeah. yeah. Call Mike. Call, call Mike. Call Michael. Thank you so much for having us. Michael, it's been a pleasure. I very much enjoyed these past two and a half hours and uh, I'll see you in the next world. And don't be late. Don't be late. <laughs>